This week, of course, is joy, joy to the world. Right? Probably, maybe joy, joy to the world, that phrase and, and that, that word joy um, is, is the term that's often most associated with Christmas. Maybe may only rivaled by love, right? Um, and we'll talk about that next week. So we see joy and, and, and we go for joy, right? We see joy in the eyes of an eight-year-old child as they rip open gifts. Matter of fact, that's why we, in our world, tend to give more and more gifts because we like the look on their face, if only for a moment, as they're ripping open that package. And then when they find pajamas in there and they whip it off to the side, and they, if there's another gift, there, there's still the joy in their eyes, right? So we see it there. We feel joy on great occasions. Um, I, I've been at very, uh, I, I don't think I've ever been at a wedding, I should say, that hasn't felt joyous in, in what it is, right? The, the, the start is always great. And just that occasion and that time, um, you know, we have, we have uh, only a few pictures. We made the mistake at our wedding of letting a family member do pictures because they said that they, you know, like almost professional. Don't ever do that, all right? But we do have some, and the ones we have, I got this goofy smile all over my face. Um, Danielle, I'm not so sure about. I'm sure she's thinking. No, no, she does too, right? We have this smile because it's a joyous time. Uh, there could be some joy, at, you know, professional athletes when they win the big game, when they win the championship, and they're just, you know, these grown men and women are hopping around, jumping, and and, and throwing all caution to the wind as they celebrate uh, the victory that they have. The Hebrew word for joy means to leap or spin around with pleasure. In the New Testament, the word refers to gladness, bliss, and celebration. The problem with joy in our world is that it's often momentary and fleeting. You know, we're, we're, we're looking for occasion to give us some joy. Right? We're looking for those times, which is, again, why we rap more and why, why we like to watch kids as they open presents. And so we, we try to recreate it. That's what we try to do. We try to recreate joyous moments. We try to, try to, to kind of work it up again, to hoop it up and to holler and to figure out what we can do about that. And so, of course, uh, we need, it's time, and what we're doing this Christmas is we're rethinking Christmas, and in Advent, we're rethinking each of this. And so today, we're going to rethink joy, and that's what we're going to do. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open up to the book of John, chapter 15. Um, and as you do that, I mean, you know, real joy, godly joy, is an amazing thing. Joy brings life. It, it's invigorating in your life. As a matter of fact... When joy is flowing out of us, we say things like, I feel alive. I feel alive. I feel like, I feel like this life is worth living in everything we do. Not just talking about a happy flutter in your belly, but real joy. But let me tell you this. Joy is not just a momentary thing. Joy matures and it ripens on the vine. And it, and it comes from a life. I would tell you, ultimately, a, a joy that remains, a joy that's there, comes from a life vitally connected, connected to, the, to the real source of life. So look with me. John chapter 15, we see in this God's desire for us. And God's desire for us is joy. So we're going to start at the end of the passage that, that we're going to preach on. Look at John chapter 15, verse 11. <coughs> Jesus says, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you. It's pretty cool, right? That my joy might be in you and that your joy may be made full. Let me read that again. These things I have spoken to you, Jesus says, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Do you know? That God wants you to be filled with joy. You know, I think sometimes we have this picture of God that he's just kind of out there to ruin our fun and to ruin our, 
our, our, our, you know, our, our, our joy to, to crush it and to not let us do what we want to do because what we're doing is, you know, we, I just want to, I just want to do what's going to make me happy. And as Troy <coughs> brought out, there's a difference between happiness and joy, I would tell you. Happiness is momentary, but happiness is based on circumstances. Right? Happiness, happiness, I mean, listen, and, and, and sometimes you just wake up happy, don't you? I mean, every once in a while, you just wake up and you're like, man, I'm feeling good. Had a good eight hours of sleep. For some of you, I had a good 12 hours of sleep, whatever it takes. Right? You, you, had, you had a good sleep. You're just rested. You're waking up. You're looking forward to the day. You know, everything, ha- you're, just, you're just there, right? Maybe it's Christmas morning that you kind of feel that. You're like excited and there's an anticipation of it, right? And then somebody does something that you don't want them to do quite yet. And you get a little annoyed at that. Or you're driving to where you're going and somebody cuts you off and you're a little annoyed at that. Or, or things aren't doing, you know, you, you have a plan and that plan is not being carried through. That's not what I want to do. And this, and this fleeting thing, this happiness, and we'll even, we'll even say to people, how come you have to ruin things for me when I'm happy? This is what couples talk about when they're in bad places. When they're in bad places, they go, why, why do you always got to, why do you always got to, like, why can't I just be happy? Right? So, so our happiness is affected by what's going on around us, by what's happening, and, uh, those kind of those kind of things around us. Um, and I like what Mac, uh, uh, Malcolm Muggleridge, he was a British journalist and a, an apologist in the early 1900s. He said this. He said he said I can I can say that I never knew what joy was until I gave up pursuing happiness, or cared to live until I chose to die. For these two discoveries, I am beholden to Jesus. Let me read that again. He said, I can say that I never knew what joy was until I gave up pursuing happiness or cared to live until I chose to die. For these two discoveries, I'm beholden to Jesus. (laughs) Scripture is replete with verses of joy and with with telling us to be joyous and <clears throat> and, and what our joy is and how it can be made full. I'll, I, I don't have time to go through, I mean, we could sit here all day and go through verses of that. But let me give you just a few. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 and 1 Thessalonians, same thing, 5.16, tell us to rejoice always. Right? Matter of fact, in Philippians, he says it again. I, I'll say it again. Rejoice. Rejoice. And we go, well, how can I be happy if, if everything's going wrong? See, you're basing it on your circumstances. That's not what God's telling us to do. Philipp, uh, uh, Psalm chapter 118 says this. There it is. Psalm 118, verse 24. He said, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So do you see what he's saying? He's beginning to change that narrative in our heart that it's not about whether things are going right today. Why can I rejoice in this day? Because it's a day that God has given us. Because it's a day that the Lord has made. Get this, James even tells us that we can consider it all joy when we encounter various trials, James chapter 1, verse 2. Is that crazy? Wait, wait, we can consider it joy. So get this, that narrative is, is that even when things aren't exactly what they should be, at least what we should say, what we think they should be, we can count it as all joy. We can consider it all joy in what we have. See, there's a difference between happiness and joy, right? There's a difference between feeling good in the circumstances that are wrapped around what's going on in my life and something that's deeper than that. Even when things are bad, God says that that we should consider it all joy. 
Let me give you one more. And I love this one. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 says this. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. See what he's saying? <laughs> so you see where he's gone, right? Peter says, we've never seen him. Have, have, have you ever seen Jesus? I've, I've not seen Jesus. I've seen Jesus working, right? But I've not seen Jesus physically before me. Anybody, matter of fact, if anybody says they do, it, it, it's, it's not real. Because Jesus said he's not coming again until he comes again in glory, right? So, so I've not seen him, and I'm not going to see him until the end, whether that's Jesus coming back or me dying. <laughs> and yet, even though I don't have him with me right now, in my visible view, I believe in him. And I greatly rejoice, he says, with joy inexpressible and full of glory. How cool is that? How cool is that? Right? That's what Jesus is saying back in John chapter 15. <clears throat> he says, I've spoken these things so that my joy might be in you. Not your joy, which is, you know, if, if we can define joy that way, it, like we did earlier, like in momentary things, in the, in the child opening gifts, or in the victory of a game, or in a marriage celebration, which is a joyous occasion, Right? But, but those things are temporary, or, or, or at least momentary, I should say. But I got some good news for you. Jesus is not temporary or momentary. And what you have in Christ is not temporary or momentary. And so when we, when we accept him and when we have him, we can have his joy, not my joy. A joy which is not human-based and circumstances based, you know, happiness, but something that will never go away. And Jesus said, I've, I've spoken these things so that you may have my joy and that the joy that you have may be full, may be complete, may be mature. You know, again, not a, not a joy that's in human circumstances, but a joy that's based in Christ. How cool is that, right? So I don't know about you, you know, but maybe... I know what you're thinking, and you're like, I want some of that. I want some of that joy. How do I get that joy, Patrick? How do I get that kind of joy? Well, Jesus said in this passage, right, I've spoken these things, so I guess we better go figure out what he said. So let's look back. John chapter 15, verse 1. This is Jesus speaking. <coughs> Jesus said, I am the vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. You've already, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as my Father's, just as I've kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that your joy, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. All right, so what is he saying? He's saying that joy comes from abiding. Joy comes <clears throat> from abiding. Now, we read this verse, right? And you may, you may think that this verse is about, 
And, and, and like the thrust of this verse is about producing fruit. Right? So, so some might take this passage. I don't know. I, I don't, I, I, I don't, maybe they have. Maybe some pastors have. And, and, it's a, and it's a, really the point is, is that you need to produce fruit. Fruit, 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 fruit. And let me tell you, that's a major theme here, right? We've seen fruit all over this passage. It talks about fruit. It talks about the, the, the go and bear fruit and those things. But that's not the challenge. Because his point here is that fruit is the result, right? Fruit is the product of abiding. Fruit is the product of abiding. There have been way too many pastors and way too many church members who think that I've got to go out there and I've got to produce fruit. And so we, you know, like we think if we really strain hard enough for Jesus, pop. Something's going to pop out. All right? And something might pop out, but it probably isn't going to be pretty. All right? I don't want to see what pops out in that, in that time. John is all about abiding. Eleven times abiding is talked about in these verses alone. Eleven times. Forty times in the book of John, 27 times in his three epistles. John is all about abiding. To abide literally means to remain. So the emphasis in this passage is to remain connected to the vine. Now, who's the vine? Jesus, right? I, I've got to be connected to Christ in all I do. In other words, it's not about you. God's not going, get out there, people, and produce fruit. Oh, you're not strong enough. What's wrong with you? The do you ever notice when Jesus is chastising his disciples that he doesn't say, how come you're not strong enough? How come you're not able enough? How come you're not, what does he say? Why do you doubt? Why do you lack faith? Well, wait a second, Jesus. I thought you were telling me to do something. And, and, and we'll get to that. Fruit's important. But what Jesus is saying is, no, 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 I need you to come to me. Stop trying to produce something. It's not going to be. And, and what you, well, I should say, you can produce something. It's just not necessarily going to be of him. It's just not necessary. I mean, it, it may look good. It may be shiny. But it's kind of like you ever gone into someone's house, house and they have this bowl of fruit and you're really hungry and they say, like, make yourself comfortable. If you want something to eat, let's go get something to eat. And you're just like, well, that apple looks really good. And then you pick it up and you're like, well, that's a fake apple. That's a wax apple. You're not going to eat that. Well, you know what? Some of us produce wax fruit. It looks really, really good on the outside, but it's not full of anything. It's not full of anything. And so we're, we're commanded to remain in the presence of the Lord. I, I love what C.S. Lewis said. C.S. Lewis, in one of his sermons that he gave, he said this, Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures. Fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. And I love what he says. We are far too easily pleased. See, what we, we like is, well, we, well, I've produced something. Isn't that good enough? Well, you know, all what I really want, and see, this is where we're out for. See, we're, we're out for happiness. We're out to feel good. And so if it makes me feel good, then it must be all right, right? That's a lie of Satan. And so what that produces is it might produce even some sort of fruit. I mean, sometimes it's a poisonous apple, right? Sometimes it's a wax apple filled with nothing. Sometimes it's kind of like what Jesus said. You know, you're like, a, you're like a, a, a tombstone, you know, like, a, like a, a crypt that's beautiful on the outside, all adorned, but it's full of dead man's bones. 
See, we, we are satisfied with the things of the world. We go, all right, well, yeah, Jesus, I want Jesus too, but I want everything else. I want all this other stuff. C.S. Lewis, we are too, far too easily pleased with things that taste like wax. We're far too easily pleased playing in the mud when what God wants us to do is bask in the sun. And what we have. Psalm 16, verse 11. God says, you will make known to me the path of life and in your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. Now, I want you to keep that verse up there, Gary. I want you to look at that verse. So, so what does that verse say, right? This is the Old Testament. This is the Old Testament. Uh, it's a Psalm of David. God is saying, he, he, make known to me the path of life. Life. Real life. Life that is full. Life that is abounding. Life. It's not found in playing with the things of the world. It's not found with, with finding, you know, somebody that you're just compatible with today. It's not about something that's going to bring me some sort of pleasure that today, as long as I'm happy, right? Real joy. I mean, I mean, I mean real life. And, and in your presence is the fullness of joy. So what he's saying is, is that you're settling for temporary pleasures that, that, I mean, let's be honest, they're pleasurable. I mean, for the moment, they please. But they're kind of like diet soda. I, I hate diet soda. Right? Because you drink it, and it, and it, at first, like for the very first little bit, it's, it's okay. And then this aftertaste comes. And it's like, bleh. Get it out of my mouth. I can't take it. I hate it. I hate it. Right? Why? Because it's fake. It's fake sugar. And I'm all about real sugar, if you know me. <laughs> Give me sugar. Right? So Jesus says, you're, you're trading in. I, I've given you life. I've shown you what life is. Jesus said, I am the life. Right? No, no, keep it up. Okay, put it back up. I am the life. He says, in him. In his presence is the fullness of joy. And then he says this, in your right hand, there are pleasures forever. See, we think if we're in Jesus, okay, I know I got heaven, but like it's not very, you know, I'm not having a good time. Things aren't going really right. Right? Things aren't going really right. And that's because we're way, we're far too easily pleased. And we settle for that which is momentary and temporary instead of the things that will last. And I get it because sometimes you work really hard at something and it just doesn't fulfill like you thought it would. Sometimes you do a ministry and you're working hard for Jesus and you're not seeing the fruit that you want to see. Sometimes you're in a relationship and you're not exactly seeing the fruit that you want to see. I want to ask you to raise your hand, but how many are there? Because, listen, e even in our great church, there's not one or two, there's several. And all of us have been through dry times in our marriages where we wonder. And we think, maybe it'll make me happier out there. And it's funny because the Clementes, and so I'm watching babies in the back, and they're so cute, but the Clementes came up here, and I challenged them a few weeks ago as they dedicated Angelo to the Lord, right, and just a great letter and just a great time. But I challenged them, right, that, that, that they're called not to make him happy, but to make him holy, to raise him not just to be a happy kid, but to raise him in holiness. So that means that you, 
you, you, you, you choose right over temporary ease. And, and if there's, there's no other place but in childhood where that is hard, right? Because your child wants to freak out and can be loud, and, can, and no matter what you do, they're only going to get louder. And yet you stick to your guns, and you raise them in Christ, and you show them the right path, right? So that in the end, you know, when they are old, they will not walk away from them. A lot of pain at times into our eardrums even on that. Well, guess what, adults? The same is true for us. God's not out for your happiness. He's out for your holiness. Because what you will settle for in happiness is not good enough for him. It's not a joy that's full. A joy that's complete. So that comes with abiding. So how do we know if we're abiding? All right, how do we know if we're abiding? Well, because I get this warm, fuzzy feeling every time I, I pray to Jesus. Listen, if you've been in Jesus any period of time, you know that you don't always get a warm, fuzzy feeling every time you pray to Jesus. Right? So how do I know? Well, abiding produces fruit. Abiding produces fruit. So what is the place of fruit in all of this? Right? Fruit is vital in life with the disciple. But fruit does not make you a disciple. Can, can Please hear that, because I, I think sometimes we get that confused. Well, that person is really nice. That person is caring and loving and giving. That person is sweet, and, you know, my grandmother just bakes cookies for me every time I go over, and my grandfather hands me $20. They're awesome people. And awesome people, you know, you know what, they'll be... Awesome people that we think are awesome people in hell? Because they produce some sort of niceness or kindness doesn't make them a disciple of Jesus Christ. It doesn't make them. See, see we think too often if we are obedient, we will abide. But it's just the opposite. If we abide, we'll be obedient. So the, the point is, is that I need to press into Jesus. I need to be in Christ first by believing and accepting his love and his forgiveness for me. And then I need to continue to abide in him. Continue to stay connected to the vine. Because what the vine does is nourishes me and, and, and enables me to produce fruit. That what comes out of me is not me but Jesus. The world has had enough of me. The world has had enough of you. What the world needs is not me. And what the world needs is not you. What the world needs is Jesus. Now, they're not going to see Jesus because he's not coming again until he comes again in glory. So how are they going to see Jesus? Guess what? They see Jesus in us. They see Jesus in us and in all we do. So it's great. Notice this, notice this progression in here, right? So the progression in this passage is this, this fruit passage, which feels like fruit, but it's really not. Um, if you're connected to the vine, you'll produce fruit, right? But, but in order to get... Fruit, you got to be connected to the vine. And so it's no fruit outside the vine. In, on the vine, it's fruit. But not only that, there's more fruit. And then there's much in this passage. If you're inviting, again, if you're not inviting in Christ, there'll be no fruit. There's no such thing, there's no such thing as ungodly righteousness. Just like there's no such thing as a little white lie. We might dress it up, right? You can put a dress on a pig, but the pig is still a pig, right? You can dress up evil and make it look really good, but in the end of the day, what is it? 
It's evil. It is never anything but that. So if you're connected, you produce fruit. As a matter of fact, if you're producing fruit, what does it say he's going to do? Look at verse 2. He says, every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. Now we get like, why isn't a little fruit enough? Why does God have to prune? Why does God have to prune? Because God wants more fruit in your life. Because God wants you to evidence what you have in him. He prunes so that that you may bear more fruit. Now he says, I love this, verse 3. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Now, you know what I, I can picture him doing right there? He's stopping and going, whoa, 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 whoa. Just in case you think that I'm talking about that you need to produce fruit to be in relationship with me, that's not what we're talking about. I'm not, I'm not asking you to produce fruit outside of relationship with me. Matter of fact, you can only produce godly fruit if you're in relationship with me. And that doesn't mean that you come to church every Sunday, although you should come to church every Sunday. It doesn't mean that you were baptized or that you went to Sunday school. It doesn't mean anything like that. It means that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, with God through Jesus Christ. It means that you've accepted his love and his grace and his forgiveness for you, and you are in his family as his child. And so he says, you do that, you'll begin to produce fruit. And, and I was listening to a sermon this week, and he reminded us. He said, I'm not trying to be obnoxious, and maybe you're new even watching. Um, but um, if you never produce fruit of Christ, then you have to question whether you're in Christ. If you are in Christ, you will produce fruit. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean you don't screw up. Doesn't mean you'll always produce fruit. You should always produce fruit, right? Matter of fact, what does a lack of fruit, who is somebody who is connected to the vine or somebody who is in Christ, what does a lack of fruit mean? It means that you're not connected. It means that you've, that you've turned away, that you've taken your eyes off of Jesus in some way. And so he prunes you so that you'll produce more fruit and better fruit. He molds and he shapes us into what he wants us to be. Right? So he says, I am the vine, you are the branches, verse 5. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Talks about those that don't do anything. He throws into the fire. He says, verse 7, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. That's not a formula for getting what you want for Christmas. That is a formula for the fact that if you will abide in Jesus and draw unto him, his heart will be your heart. And the things that you ask will be the things that he wants and you will get them. Then he says this, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. So that you prove my disciples. Again, so what's the place of fruit? Fruit shows where you're connected. That's all fruit does. So when something comes out of you that is not godly, you can't go, oh, 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 that wasn't from me. I, I don't know where that came from. Guess where it came from? It came from you. Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, I was, so what you could say is, I'm sorry, I was connected to the wrong thing right there. I connected myself to something of the flesh instead of something of the spirit. So if we abide in him, we'll produce much fruit and God is therefore glorified. And again, that's all throughout scripture. Let me just read one more verse, Psalm 1. I love this psalm. Psalm 1 says this, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, 
and in his light he medi- in his law he meditates day and night. So in other words, I don't go to the world for my counsel. I don't go for the world for my pleasure. I don't go for the world and the things of the world to make me momentarily happy where I get to a place where Solomon was, where he had all wisdom and all things. And yet he says, it's all vanity. It's all vanity. Like you, you try to, it's all vanity. And that's what happens. There's this bitter taste in your mouth, and you grow to be people who are older, who are bitter and upset. And longing for the days gone by of when I was young, and I had some sort of youth and some sort of activity and some sort of life. He says, you don't sit in that. Instead, you delight in his law. You delight in his word. And you know what will produce of that? Verse 3, he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. That's a good word. That's a good word. Listen, here's the point. Joy is a great thing. I have had many times in my life, I wasn't jumping up and down when I married Danielle on the outside, but I was jumping up and down on the inside, right? I've had many human experiences. I've I've played on sports teams where we've won games. And we're jumping around, hooting and hollering for that. I've I've been in places where I've seen joy. I, I, I love watching children and the brightness that they have of opening gifts. But they are temporary. And they are fleeting. And and I can testify now, my kids grow up, and although we try to produce excitement in our house at the gifts as they go out, uh, my kids still try to do it a little bit. And I'm like, yeah, whatever, I'm too tired and old, leave me alone. You know, I mean, it just, it doesn't have the same flair as it did. With a young kid. So now we got to marry my boys off and have grandkids so we can have excitement again, right? I don't know. Is that really where where the end is? Got to always have kids walking through your house? Until what happens? You don't have kids walking through your house, and then what? And then your joy is gone, and all you have is memories. And all you have is, wow, I wish. And joy to, uh, Jesus doesn't want that for you. Jesus wants you to have something that is greater and better and not based on those, but a joy that is deep and full, that is constantly there, and that is only found in him. It only comes, that joy only flows as you know who you are and what you have in Jesus Christ every day. And not what you don't have in the world. Joy is is, is not based on what you're going to get for Christmas this year. It's based on what I already have. It's based on the fact that the gift has already been given to me, the greatest gift that can ever be given, Jesus And that he has died for me and that I am in him and I have life. And nothing and no one can take that away from me. In many ways, really, joy is just about keeping focus. It's about keeping your eyes on Jesus. It's what what the author of Hebrews said. Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, Let us lay aside every encumbrance. Maybe those are Christmas gifts. Maybe that's a hope for a new car. Sorry, Colleen. You know, right? Maybe that's a hope for something that you'll get. And if I just get this, then I'll be satisfied and I'll never want anything else again. Any of you ever been promised that by a kid? If you just give me this, I'll never ask you for anything else again. And what happens? They ask again. They ask again. Lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that you're trying to gain some happiness from. The sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with race the endurance set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. 
the author and perfecter of our faith, and I love this, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Was the cross joyful? The cross was horrific. The cross was a curse. Cursed is every man who hangs on a tree, Scripture says. And yet, for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. And you know what the joy set before him was? Us. That we would be in relationship with God by the fact that he died for us. You keep your eyes on him and your joy, and you will have his joy, and your joy will be made full. You wonder why? I wonder. Why do, why do so many Christians lack joy in their life? There's not one of us who should. And the reality is, is that we lack joy because too many of us have been caught up in the things of the world. You know what you need to do? Get caught up in Jesus. Get caught up in Jesus. Let me pray. Father God, I love you. I thank you for your grace and mercy and love and joy and hope. I thank you for what you do and what you give and who you are, Father. Father, may we not be filled with the things of this earth, but may we be filled with you. May we be filled with the things of Christ. Not hoping for what we might have momentarily, but knowing what we have eternally. To your glory and to your good. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.